<laughs> All right, so I, the right. Menorah, I put the put the menorah, the Lego menorah in the back, so we have more brightness. Is that good, Kevin? Yeah. Okay, great. All right, ready to go. Medicaid does it all except make money. That's what my, mother, my grandmother tells me all the time. You told me you had 300 million hits on YouTube. 300, yeah, from one video. And you made? At zero. But I made many, many people smile and inspired. So yeah, you didn't, there's no price tag on that. No, I didn't make, no, my grandmother was not happy with that still. She was like, what? You didn't make money? Right, come on. No AdSense? Come on. She knows somehow she doesn't know too much about social media, but she knows everything about AdSense. Right. You know, about monetization. I'm like, Bobby. I could make a on. Jewish joke, but okay, let's uh, well, let's move it on. From all right, Rabbi Simcha Scholar. Yes. Rabbi Simcha Scholar. Wow. Scholar, scholar. <laughs> scholar. That's, Thinker, this, philosopher. That's coming soon, but right now we're with Rabbi Simcha Weinstein. Yes. Do you like going by Rabbi or should I call you Simcha? Let's go Rabbi Simcha. Rabbi Simcha? Yeah. All right. Or Rabbi. Simcha does not Rabbi Weinstein. Not Rabbi Weinstein. I feel old. And, uh, you know, uh, decrepit. All right, Rabbi Simcha. We'll stick to Rabbi Simcha. Rabbi Simcha, one of my favorite lines uh, from you, Rabbi Simcha. This is part of the... This right, is we're on now. We're, we're rolling. podcasting right now. I don't now. know when we're on. We're when, live. We're I don't live. know when Mez on or when Mez off. Life I think you're is, always on. I'm okay. a, I'm a, in your presence, right. you give off such a great energy. I'm, always, I'm on. I'm on right now. We're on. We're live right, recording right, right. the I have video. I the word energy, by the way. Huh? You're energy. Pro- Why? What's energy. It's like energy. It's like a new age, you know. Is it a new age? New age I- hoka masquerading as spirituality. Well, energy. Okay. What's energy? Let's okay, see. moving on, We're gonna on, get man. to the rabbi part of your name right, soon. Let's get right now, energy. let's let's Fine. get let's get it start. One yes. of my favorite lines from you, yes. Rabbi Simcha, is one of my is anybody whose name ends in a man is neither is either Jewish or a superhero. One more time, anybody whose name ends in a man is either a Jewish or a superhero. I think you're trying to say if your name ends in man, <laughs> you're either Jewish, Lippman, Feldman, Goldman, or a superhero, <laughs> Superman. Spider-Man, Batman. Yeah, that's exactly what there I was trying go. to go for. That's timing yeah. right there. Right. You got your catchphrase, I got my catchphrase. <laughs> I gotta stick to what I got. All right, stay got. on brand, ABC. <laughs> yeah. Well, always be. Closing, baby. Mm. Except the 300 million uh, yes, hits. Yes, yes. Oh, okay, don't bring that back. It makes me yeah, really feel strange painful. about it. So, Rabbi Simcha, talk to me. What, what are you, where did your fascination... I mean, you're, you're, you're a rabbi, you're on campus, you're young, you're hip, you're, you're revolutionizing what Judaism means to so many young people. I find you fascinating. I think you're really repackaging. I don't know if you go on and call it repackaging. It's Judaism, but it's really relatable to this generation. We're going to talk about that soon. But one thing that, you know, we just saw, actually we had coffee a few days ago, and you, yeah. you gifted me your book, Oive. And um, it's all about, you're known as the comic book. Glad book. I gifted it to you, by the way, finding out the, yeah, the, the <laughs> finances behind <laughs> Apparently, it doesn't pay to be an influencer. <laughs> it, okay, we're moving on. Yes. Yes, I gifted on. you the book. You gave me the book. I had the book. I read You want the, the origin re- story. And I'm like, yes. I just want to know, like, how did you become the comic? What, what, what when did you start become so fascinated with comic books? You know what? Why? As a kid, I, and I didn't grow up religious, Hasidic. Uh, I, I grew up normal, I like to tell people. From Manchester, <laughs> England, secular Jewish kid. I didn't realize until recently we have uh, a Manchester connection. Yes. And uh, for me growing up, I was like kind of shy, nebbish, and nerdy. I was somewhat bullied in high school, and I found solace in pop culture, uh, specifically superheroes. I was never really aware that there was an intrinsically Jewish connection, but I, I kind of related to the idea of the outsider insider that uh, you know we could be sort of out, outwardly awkward yet uh, inwardly heroic. And then many years later, when I became uh, a rabbi and became the rabbi of Pratt Institute, where we're sitting today, yeah. which is interesting because I went to art school and now I'm back in. I never left school. And basically. now you're the art rabbi. I get to minister to myself 20 years ago. I mean, who has that, <laughs> who has that experience? Um, and when I first became rabbi, I tried to connect to the students. You know, I tried all the, the typical um, Chabad shtick. Don't, you know, I'm in trouble over there. But... Uh, about on campus, I still try. Uh, it was, you know, the Sabbath, kosher. And students would say, Simcha, you're a great guy. You're funny. You were clearly good looking, charismatic. But mm. this is art school. So uh, I started to talk about the synthesis. Well, before, before we go down the I'm road getting of you being to rabbi. the superhero thing. All right, okay. So I started talking about the synthesis of theology and pop culture. And really, over copious bowls of chicken soup at three o'clock in the morning, <laughs> I reread the classic comic books of my youth mm. through the lens of, I guess, Jewish history, culture, and values. And that really started me off on the journey to finding a Jewish uh, influence on superheroes. What did that was the synthesis, the genesis? That. What did what did the comic books? What did the heroes from the comic books do for you as a child? Wow, as a child, I guess I was like I said, I was this shy, I was nervous, I was nerdy, I, I was bullied. Uh, they gave me, I was bullied, you know, I had what's called uh, in the Gemara an, an atomic wedgie. You're familiar with the atomic wedgie? <laughs> I'm not, the Talmud uh, talks I think about well, no, yeah, atomic, it's when the undies are pulled clean over the head. Oh, gosh. That's, 
<laughs> I remember I had atomic this wedgie. Took place. Yeah, and then one guy he held me on the radiator. Oh, so gosh. I got the atomic wedgie. I'm on the radiator, and my bag was thrown in the girls' bathroom, and it, I had to like go in. With it was a uh, and, and I traumatizing. Saw, yeah, I kind of realized in school that I had a superpower of my own, and that was like the power of humor, and that when you're funny, three things happen. Number one, the bullies bully you much less. You know, number two, the cool kids like you much more. And number three, the girls, two out of three, <laughs> is respectable. Uh, so I discovered this kind of, and it was really, it was kind of a way, you know, Mel Brooks said, I think if you have the last laugh, you win even when you lose. So for me, it was kind of, it was really a way to have the last laugh. It was a way, it was a coping mechanism. It was a way to overcome. I was obsessed with Star Wars. My earliest memories are like sitting in the backyard, playing with Star Wars, recreating, imagining. And now the fact that these tropes of my childhood, you know, have, uh, are back in vogue. It's really, it's amazing the fact that I'm able as an adult to see these things, you know, through the adult lens, through the spiritual lens. So for me, it's like, it's the golden age. I get to go to Comic Con as a rabbi. No way. You're gonna, yeah. How's that yeah, experience? I've been to San Diego. I've been to New York. I, I, I had the honor of being on stage, you know, with my idols. I, I had the chance to, uh, to present a number of years ago with Jerry Robinson, who created um, the Joker. He, he was behind a lot of the early Batman uh, comic books. And to be on a panel with Jerry, and he told me that he wished I was his rabbi growing up. And, and so What a I. compliment. Yeah, man. Jerry, Ro I couldn't believe it. So that to me is, the, it's such Listen, an Listen, a honor. jokester like you being the rabbi of the Joker, or the creator of the uh, Joker. I told Jerry, I pray to God, but you are, you know, a God. <laughs> so uh, it was amazing. That's insane. So yeah. what do you think of that, that, you know, right now there's been a boom in the, the Marvel DC world when it right. comes to the creation of all these superhero movies. What do you think it talks about, it says about our culture that we're so obsessed that we, that we love these superheroes. What's the do? Like, what? What do you think that is? I think it's a few. Number one, they're really good movies. Number two, uh, the biggest opener after 9/11 was Spider-Man, and I think America takes solace in pop culture. I think we've always turned to culture. I think you know the culture vultures, the content creators, the media mavens uh, like yourself. They shape, they dictate, they give motivation, they give power, they heal. So uh, I think in this age of like terrorism and viral terrorism and and this new form of post 9/11 terrorism that can strike you know anywhere at any time and and the fact that we're we're so nervous and and I think that you know they give a lot of hope and I think they they, they really heal and they help. I think certainly, you know, in this this age, in, in I guess in the social media age, which you know, yeah, you, we're you are, you booming. are the influencer that makes no guilt. Uh, <laughs> by the way, the fat Jewish. I don't yeah. want to tell you. I looked yeah. at his uh, net worth, man. Oh but, man, uh, yeah, you got to get worth? What's you got to get worth? fatter and you got to get a man bun because you are missing the boat, that baby. That fat Jewish is. You got to wow, start selling character. wine. You got to get to South Beach. Uh, what, what are we talking about? I can't remember. We're, oh, we're, we're talking about okay. The so generation. Now, of, I think today, now that we're influencers, yeah. and, and now it's no coincidence, the most successful movie of the 21st century is yeah. Avatar, Avatar, where the protagonist chooses his avatar, his second life over his real life, where we all live vicariously. And I'm not, I'm not claiming to, you know, be any, you know, woke, enlightened. Uh, I'm doing the same thing. I'm checking my likes right now in between. I'm going to be posting this. Uh, you <laughs> we're know, live we're, right now. We're all doing it. We're all living vicariously. So um, I think that, you know, I think the superheroes gives a little more depth to that, that we acknowledge the fact there are masks. We are living clandestinely. We're all hiding behind filters. You know, we're all a little uh, insecure. We're all trying to fit in. So I think the superheroes, they tapped into something. We'll get into the origins yeah. of the creators, where they c came from. Their mind, but they just tapped into something so profound, so universal. And, you know, the Avengers have returned to the box office and we need mm. them more than ever. Mm. Now, do you, I mean, do you think it's also talking to a, a level? I, I really love the angle that you're saying that that there's this there's this understanding that like okay we're, we wear masks these people these superheroes wear masks to go about their life but do you think it also taps into this inner like feeling and voice and confidence that we have like you know what within me i possibly am a superhero i have a hero within me that just needs some help that needs some masking and i could share that with the world um spoiler alert man you are not a superhero um you cannot fly right. uh okay <laughs> just wanna <laughs> i'm sorry, to, I'm sorry to, <laughs> stay no, humble stay sorry humble. to break that um no, I, I think so. I think, yeah, they definitely, I mean, I, I kind of look at it like from a, a uh, Kabbalistic perspective. There's mm -hmm. like- Why uh, the quotations? Uh, for the audience. Um, We're on a podcast. Okay. Oh, you're right. But this- Yeah, we are. We video. got we Will. Also, we got Kevin. Yeah, we got video. We got right, video rolling. Right. All right. 
right, podcast right. listeners, if you are more of a visual this person, you can come visit YouTube. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Just trying to pitch the yeah, YouTube channel. Yeah, it's like a, it's a roast. So, um, no, I, I think what it is is like, you know, in, in Jewish thought, there's an idea of like, um, you know, chitzonia, it's like an external side, which really ties into the, the story of Purim. Like, uh, yeah. you know, Purim which being... Which only a few uh, weeks away. Yeah, we're getting there. So, the, and the idea is that outside the, the chitzonia, the external layer is a panemius. We know the word for face, Panim is connected to panim, internal. The idea. What in does face panim mean for those? So the idea in in Judaism is that that you know we're supposed to in our external actions are supposed to match the internal convictions. We're trying to achieve a yeah. a state of flow, which is the opposite of the Latin, by the way. Like you know, face comes from the word facade, like mm. an entirely external construct. So yeah, no, I think superheroes do. You know, I think that there's like this kind of symbolic idea that there is something within that we do have this inner strength, this you know inner power, uh, and, and that that can transcend. And I think that when you know the kids uh, are, are watching uh, Spider Man uh, or Superman or Captain America or X Men, I think it shows them that they can go self beyond self, that they can be bigger and brighter and bolder. Yeah, and I think it's extremely empowering. Why do you think? Why do you think? Um, it seems like from all the superheroes that have been being recreated in these days, Spider Man has the most remakes. Why Spider Man? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I think they just didn't get it right. To be honest. <laughs> they just keep on trying. <laughs> Truthfully, I think they finally got it right. I think with the latest the one new is guy, really the new good. Guy, yeah, what's British his name? Kid, what's British his name? Kid, uh, it's gonna come to um, me. Yeah, I gotta got a producer. Hey, um, we we'll call him. Yeah, we'll find him later. Oh, He's... Man, who's the other guy? There was. Oh, I'm black. Now, there's three of them. No, the, the first the guy was good. Toby Maguire. Toby Maguire. Then they went Andrew Garfield, who's Jewish, by the way. I like Andrew a lot. Uh, but, he's um, a great but actor, but the he most didn't, recent he didn't one. Nail it. No, the, the most kid, recent the one. I'm looking at it right now. London. Spider Man. Now. The most recent Spider Man. Tom Holland. Tom Holland. Oh, oh very good. Nice. So, uh, nice Tom nice. Holland began off Broadway. Uh, he's a Broadway performer. I mean, he's, he's, yeah, uh, yeah, oh, he's, he's great. He's, 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 he's a ballet. triple threat right there. He's a triple yeah, threat. Yeah, he's got it all. Yeah, and he kind of plays it. They took it back to high school. What do you think? The other, the, yeah, two homecoming, old. right? Yeah, That's what it's they called. took it back to high, high school. What? They can't. They captured because Spider Man is a teenager. Yeah, and he's unlike the other, you know, superheroes. Right, he's also bullied. So and he's he... got that angst. He's got that. It, by the way, I spoke to Patty Cochran, Dave Cochran, who they were the writers at Marvel uh, during Spider Man's inception. They said it was a given that he was Jewish. He was like this nebbish, nerdy Seinfeld with webbing. He's like Ben Stiller. He's Woody Allen. I, I love I, Christopher Nolan's Batman. Yeah, I'm I, a I, huge I fan. I happen to believe that the superheroes comics are the Shakespeare of the 21st century. You know, um, to me, I I, I, th I I hold Stanley above. You know, he's to me he's above Mark Twain. To me, he's the, the greatest writer of, of our time. Yeah. I'll give you a crazy stat. Um, they found that uh, Stanley's uh, comics that have been made into movies through the Marvel Cinematic Universe and and through Fox, the X Men, and through Spider Man, he has extracted uh, over four dollars from every single person on planet Earth. Wow. That's like the level. Wow. That, that, that's the, the, the level that of, of money impact and, and, also, impact and yeah. power. You always go back to money, Rabbi. I know. Well, I'm trying to help you out over here. Yeah. But uh, no, I mean, I had the honor to speak to Stanley when I wrote my book, Up Up and Ove. And yeah, I had How, the What kind of guy and, is he? What and, kind of guy uh, was he? You know, he took my call. It was incredible. Call. Who wow. takes my call? You don't even take my call. I don't. Stan Lee took my call. I, I couldn't believe incredible. it. Incredible. I, I called up Power Entertainment. I said, Rabbi Simcha. They, I, I got to talk to Stan. They put me through and we had quite a long conversation. What? Anything, he, anything yeah, that stuck with you? He told me a few Lee? things. He told me that like the, the Hulk was sort of based on, on uh, the idea of a Jew in diaspora, that the Hulk looks different. He's not a bad guy. Because he looks different, he's feared, he's misunderstood, he's hunted, he's hated, and he's forever. So even deeper than the golem. I thought there was a connection yeah, with the golem, a golem, but it's deeper. But, that's but he told me it's kind of like, it's, sort it's, of, it's just a not fitting in. He's wandering the world searching for solace. And I think that these characters, you have to understand, they came from, you know, second generation Jewish immigrants. The late 30s, early 40s were a very anti-Semitic period. Jews could not get jobs, uh, you know, in the mainstream arts. Advertising was not hiring Jews. Comic books, were in the, they were in their infancy. They were a joke. There was no barrier to entry. So when Siegel and Schuster create Superman, you know, it, it, it was something that, uh, you know, it was considered very low art. It's not, it's not high art. It's not considered uh, sophisticated entertainment. Uh, yet the whole world could relate to that idea of kind of fitting in, being on the outside, the inside. Yeah. And uh, don't worry about it. Uh, it's an old school over it's here. A, we are 126 years old over wow. here. Wow. Wow. Yeah. School the radiator is making some it noise It used there. to be steam powered. 
So, uh, the, yeah, there's How a steam room. How old is room, Pratt Institute? I think it's 126. Really? Yeah, there's a steam room next door, which actually powers part of the campus. Oh my so gosh. the radiator could click. It could actually explode. So you can, wow. So when you go to the Schwitz, you're actually helping out the school. I, I go next door. I go. I sit there. I got, yeah, I've got in trouble once. I tried to explain. It's a, it's a Schwitz. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. So what do you, the inspiration for all these characters, I mean, take us back to the time when they were created. It was during the time of the Depression. It was time when the world wasn't that great to the Jews. And do you think that sort of helped and, cr and brought the creativity to these creators? Yeah, the Jews were barred from Ivy League schools, country clubs, even in Thai neighborhoods. So Jews couldn't get in, like we said. Right. They basically created an industry. Comic books at that point were in the middle of a newspaper. There were the pulp comics given out for free. Right. They created the idea of a superhero with a double identity, which mirrors their own lives as Jewish immigrants. They themselves, Stan Lee born Stanley Lieber. Uh, Jack Kirby, king of comics, uh, illustrated almost all of them, went to Pratt for a day, left because he couldn't afford tuition. Times have not changed. Uh, Jack Kirby born Jacob Kurtzberg. You know, Jacob, famous... Patriarch spends the night wrestling uh, with an angel. Um, so they create characters who I think really are assimilated archetypes and, and they're very symbolically created to themselves who have double identities, who have to mask and hide who they are. And I think, I mean, here's, a, you want to get deep? Yeah, let's, get let's deep. go deep. Okay. Let's I want to go deep. Kev, you want to get deep? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> Kev had to think about it. Uh, Kev's like, I'm just here for the money, man. <laughs> Kev's the only guy. Yo, okay. yo, big shout out to Kevin taking the video for today yeah, and Kev's our good. boy Will, who's doing the sound. Yeah, Will. You're the man, Will. Uh, okay, let's get deep. Yeah. There's nothing more like American than these superheroes. Take Captain America. Captain yeah. America is the flag embellished as costume. He's all American, but he's not really American. You want to get deep? We'll get deep. He's not really American. No, what do you mean? Because he, he's Coca-Cola, he's Rockwell, he's Apple Pie, but really he's the wish fulfillment of what it means to be American coming from immigrant assimilated Jews that wanted to be all American, that uh. crave the acceptance, that crave the assimilation. And the wish fulfillment was so beautiful that mainstream America adopted the fiction and fantasy as reality. Uh. I really believe you can make the argument the American dream is a Jewish invention. Incredible. So you're saying that <clears throat> when they were coming, these immigrants coming from hearing about America, the American dream, hearing about right. the possibilities and the things that they could really right. grow and right. build, right. that was the, the, the foundation <clears throat> of what Captain America yeah, was it's built not, it's on. It's not some Jewish conspiracy. It's just it's wanting to fit in. It's wanting to kind of, you know, overcome persecution, overcome. A, you think Ralph Lauren's name is Ralph Lauren? No. He created a fictional, you know, America that was more American so than America. So for those America, who are listening and you know, believe more, that Jews run the world, what do you say to that? I, I, I think, oh. I mean, Hollywood, humor, fashion. You're bracing it. You're bracing all the I, I'm stereotypes. I'm not embracing it. What I'm saying is that it really comes from a place of persecution. And only a Jew writes a song like Easter Parade. Who do you think wrote White Christmas, for goodness sake? Uh, it's, it's about creating this idealized version. And, I, and that's something that everyone, it transcends. We can all relate. So no matter who you are, what your political persuasion, sexual orientation, people can relate to being an outsider, to wanting to fit in. And I think they just tapped into something. You know, today the Jewish you know, journey has changed. You now assimilation is less of a problem, which is why the superheroes, I think, evolve with you know, the Jewish uh, culture and climate in America. Mm. The 60s, the 70s, the 80s. Got that. Yeah. Pop quiz. Yes. Speed round. You ready? Yeah. Ready. Whatever comes straight to your straight to your mind. Go. DC or Marvel? Marvel. Batman or Superman? Batman. Magneto or Prof Prof Professor X? <sighs> Magneto. Hipster or Hussid? Hipster. Lox on a bagel or falafel on a pizza? Falafel. The president or the queen? Queen. Ooh. Liverpool, hey, Malka. <laughs> Liverpool or Manchester United? Neither. What? Man City, all the way, baby. Hey, wow. Okay, you're going to get some lovers or some haters on that. All right, right. right. Geja or Balshuva? Wow. It's quite... BT, baby. BT all the way. Simcha or Simon? Wow. Depends where I am. Someone that knew me as Simon, when they say Simcha, it's weird. Someone that knows me as Simcha, so it depends where. Do you miss Simon? Context narrative. Do I miss him every day? Mm. What, do you, what, what do you miss about Simon? What do I miss about Simon? I miss that Simon... That's a, that's a real, you got real. Yes, sir. I miss my friends back home. I miss Manchester. I miss uh, going to watch Man City. I miss, 
it's weird because I've been away for so long. In my mind, everyone's still living in the late 90s. <laughs> like when I get back there, I'm like, hey, let's go to Stephen Charles and play snooker. They're like, dude, that was 17 years ago. <laughs> I got three burnt. kids and a mortgage. It ain't <laughs> happening. Um, so I guess I, I guess I miss, you know, I miss that part of my life, that, that age. It was mm -hmm. golden and glorious. So and you could do anything. You hang out in cars at four in the morning and it doesn't matter, you know? Mm. Do you take me back to that time before you were religious, before you found God, religion, Chabad. What, were, what kind of guy were you and uh, what was a transformative time? What, what changed you and, and moved you to, to start finding God? Okay, so what was I like? I was always very social, very popular. I was the class clown, but I think kind of deep down I was a bit of a mask because mm -hmm. uh, I was, you know, somewhat shy and insecure and nebbish and nerdy and, uh, you know, all the rest of it. Um, so, you know, I loved soccer. I loved, like, pop culture. And when my friends started going to nightclubs, I didn't like that. I didn't like clubs. I didn't like that kind of party scene. It didn't interest me. Uh, something about film and and the, and and the visuals and the dream you have factory. A bachelor in, you have a bachelor in I have film. A, I have film. a bachelor film in film history. Well, you did your homework yeah. over here. Yes, sir. Yeah, there's not <laughs> much you could do with film history apart from <laughs> become a Chabad rabbi. Uh, well, can, has that all? It's, I mean, it's, I think there's all pieces of the puzzle. Yeah, right? it helped ironically, you. it's helped me. Yeah, it, it really you are, has you're a me. scout on yeah, yeah, films. Yeah, That's yeah, so yeah, cool. So I, I guess what it was, well, yeah. So, oh, you, you, you unbelievable. It's, it's like Oprah over here. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it was really, like, I kind of dreamed of being in the film industry. That was the dream. And then I got in. I was not, like, high level, but I was involved. And uh, I guess meeting your idols is never a good thing because it was a little... Uh, you know, ego, it's short-term gigs, as you know, the industry. It's not long-term. So everyone's just kissing the tuchus of the person above them to get to the next gig. And it didn't really fulfill me. It didn't really inspire me. Uh, in college, I did a study, a photography study, uh, and I figured I'd study, like, Hasidic Jews because I think artists write about what they know about. So I figured I'll tap into the Hasids. That's different. It's kind of ironic in a second. Uh, so yeah. I would go to these. I would go to these Chabad. I didn't know it was Chabad. They were just the only Mishogunas that would talk to me. <laughs> uh, I would like cruise around the religious neighborhood, driving around, looking. Uh, for so you were looking for meaning. You were looking for purpose. Yeah, literally driving around, and and Chabad would talk to me. I ended up going to some guy's house for a Passover seder, Dov Bear Klein, because we used to go to the seder. And we'd fetch, we'd fight, we'd compare everyone to everyone's kids. When you say kids. we, you say you mean the family? Like you, me and you the family, Jews? we'd drive over, and everyone would compare everyone to everyone else, and it would kind of, and, and then everyone would like fight, and we'd get in the car, and we'd come home, and it was always like awkward. It was never really, we never really got in. It wasn't my parents' fault. They were very Jew-ish. Um, but I wanted to get into the text. I wanted to know what's going on over here. So I ended up going to this Chabad family for a Seder, and they went all night. Like literally, it's like midnight, they're still setting up the table. They went all night. And they're telling me this. You're like, starving. I'm starving. Yeah, <laughs> I got the bread in the pocket. I'm ready. I'm going out You're to the bathroom. Go. I got McDonald's. And uh, <laughs> joke. Uh, yeah, yeah, joke. Not a joke. Uh, <laughs> if you want it to be. A, so, uh, and they went all night. And that really, and ironically, there was a kid at that table who asked a question that was very profound. And I thought to myself, wow, if I ever have a synagogue, that kid's going to read the Torah. What was the question? Off camera. Today, I have a synagogue. That kid reads from the Torah. No. Yeah. That is incredible. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. So many years later, that's yeah. the same kid. Yeah. You can't, you can't make it up. You can't make it up. I can't make it up. I can't, but that would be disingenuous. <laughs> <It's> just, <laughs> yeah, you can't make it up. <laughs> wow. We're, but, yeah, we're sticking to our thing. Wow, that's incredible. So, yeah. so you met, so you, you were looking for meaning. Yeah. You found Chabad. Yeah. And what did that progress, what did that look like? What, what, just what ironically, you, to, to give full yeah. circle. Sure, sure. In Pratt Institute now, we are located next to the Hasidic community. So literally every year I see some like uh, some woke student comes over is like, Rabbi, I'm going to photograph the Hasidic Hasidic world. No one's ever done that. I'm going to pull back. I'm like, dude, you know, okay. Right? Yeah, get the program. It's been done. Yeah. Roger McKimmel, every, Hasidic right, Hipster. Right, I mean, every year. Yeah. So, yeah, go on. Back to the ranch. So I was going to say to, um, so, you, so you, you, you found religion, you found Chabad. What enticed you? What, what did you enjoy so much about Chabad's approach? You know what? It was, it was an evolution, not a revolution. It wasn't like an overnight thing. I started off with Aisha Torah. Uh, Aish were like the big, uh, I guess they were the big animal on campus. They were doing a lot of campus Shabbat dinners. And, you know, there's a big drinking culture in England. The legal mm. age is 18. So you go to the pub. That's what you do. And after like three years of going to the pub every night, it's like kind of boring. So I would go to these Shabbat dinners and they would like sing songs and tell these Devar Torahs. And it was like beautiful. Like it was so rich and so deep and so inspiring and so like different to the pub culture. Um, 
that they kind of had me at hello, or I guess shalom, uh-huh. and they offered this trip to Israel. It was a little bit like, uh, you know, bait and switch. No offense to the rabbis. It was birthright. Uh, it, well, it was kind of a birthright, and it was called the Israel Fellowships, and I think that the, the ad was literally like 20 girls on a beach all holding beer. <laughs> and, it, and it was like, how to get and it was like, go, English Jewish it was like to go to Israel for 199 pounds. I'm like, I'm in. <laughs> so I sign up and they, we get to Ben Gurion and like the girls are put on one bus. Oh, and we just saw like a gotcha. bus drive. That, like, no! that was the first bait and switch right, right there. The that bus was the... is driving off. And day one, it's like Torah codes, you oh. know, <laughs> you know, like Torah code, like, you know, so it was like some pretty, uh, you know, but looking, I met the best people, and there was a lot of intermingling. No, it was a separate uh, I mean, sleeping. So there's no, it there's was no. a great, you know, for 199 pounds. I don't, yeah. I don't want to fight because they may get us for the, you know, the full. Um, They're so sponsoring it was, this episode. It was, <laughs> ish. Um, so there was one rabbi, Rabbi Daniel Rowe, who was not even married at the time. Was my age. Even and well, he how old was? Were you? I was. Uh, 19? 19. 18? And you're saying it as if he wasn't married so, yet. So, yeah, yeah. Because they get married. They get Wednesday, married young. They get married at like 12 over here. It's a different world. <laughs> um, so, it was, he was a brilliant kid. And he is brilliant. You should, everyone should Google Daniel Rowe. Blue What's he mind up to today? Blow. What's he doing? He's not like the head of Aish. Oh, He's wow. going to be chief rabbi of England one day. In oh. fact, he may be the Messiah. Uh, he, he had wow, a, you really he, speak highly of this man. He had a, a fundamental... I, I cannot... You know, he changed my life. And we were very close, and we'd hang out, and he was brilliant, and he was kind of worldly, and he was just so kind, and I'd go to his house, and I got friendly with his family. That's how they get you. They get you yeah, with the oh, food, you know? Yeah, and they the start food, slow. Totally. And then, I think what it was, Aish was a big influence, but I needed more of a community. And in Manchester, it was the Chabad. I didn't really know it was Chabad, so, but they were the guys that would talk to me. And I think what eventually spoke to me about Chabad was the Hasidus, learning Tanya. There was like this kind of more deeper philosophical approach. And what I liked a lot was that the rabbis in Chabad, they would not compromise when it came to Judaism. They were like fanatical, you know, beards, hat. But they were also extremely worldly, like in deeply rooted in the world, like within it, but, but above it and beyond it at the same time. It was very weird. Like you could talk to the rabbis about football and politics and life. And at the same time, they could talk about, you know, uh, Hasidic and Talmud and right. very inspiring. Wow. Yeah. So you you're you, and that schlepped me to Mayanot. To Mayanot. And then Mayanot, they really, <coughs> they really got their claws into me. Yeah. Uh, like day one, it's like you know I go there with Simon. Day one, Gestetin is like and Simcha, and my head's like, who's Simcha? Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. So they, they, yeah. They 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 reprogram you. It's very smart. Like I'm Simcha, and uh, but that was fundamental because Mayanot, I was around people. Not only you know had I made this kind of evolution. But I was around other people that also made that evolution. Who were who were um, not religious and who were yeah, starting to religious. Yeah, who kind of who spoke your like language, me. who got your background. Yeah, so we and it was really the conversations on the roof, you know, at midnight. I think they were as pivotal as anything I learned oh, in the study totally. hall. Anything, yeah. Yeah, I remember when I was backpacking throughout the world. The most incredible. I mean, I'd done so many adventurous things and activities. Right. But what I really loved the most, what really sticks out were those bonfires, right? In the hostels or right. some, just like the time when you just really connect with other human beings right. and you open right. up and you share just authentically and, and the real right. talk, right? right? Keeping it real. It's a bit of a long road between you becoming religious, being surrounded by rabbis and becoming a rabbi, it's right? A long, what? windy road. <laughs> so what, what, long. how'd you end up there? You know what? It's evolution, not revolution. Yeah. Uh, and I think, you know, what it was that... Um, you know, in sort of my art, I, I got, I, I mentioned this before off camera. I, I don't know if I want to go there, but let's go there because Mayor there. K likes to go there. I was, I guess, I think I used to be, I wouldn't say more religious, but more fundamental. And today I'm trying to put the fun in mm. fundamental. Hey, you bye like bye. that? Okay, memeing it out over here. So, um, you know, when I got to my art, I took, I think there's an idea in the Hasidus of you go into the Teva, into the wood. You know, I think I took all my beetles, I threw them in the fire. I threw my comic books. I burnt them. I, I you know, I, I went full on, Every, full, full fat. Wow. And there's you a time. Cold turkey and yeah, but I needed that. I needed to not watch movies. I needed and to then reintroduce it back into your life, right? Head, Just juice it out and then see what the works. Get into the mikvah, you mm. know. I, and so, yeah, I really, I really immersed. And then, you know, I, I think it was. I, I never really intended on becoming a rabbi. I got married. I, I moved to Crown Heights. I, I went to the Kolel. Um, I found it very good to learn in Crown Heights. That was a very positive place because at the time it was not the um, epicenter of all things cool. It was kind of gross and dangerous. So <laughs> like, where are you gonna go? You know, like, so I would actually Hadar Torah. I learned well over there. 
Uh-huh. Like in there Israel, no distractions. I found that Jerusalem itself is a mitzvah, and I'm ADD. I can't sit still. So I'm like four in the morning. I'm in like you know some weird shalom factory, you know, going nuts. So in Crown Heights, I was very grounded, and um, then I did the kol and then I started doing this like smicha thing, and then my wife was subbing one day in Brooklyn Heights. I go to pick up my wife. I meet Rabbi Raskin on the street. Yeah, and oh, he's cousin like, of mine. Oh, he's like, hey, what are you doing? I'm like picking up my wife. He's like, you want to be a campus rabbi? I'm like, no. He's like, perfect. You're starting on Monday. <laughs> so it was literally like that. Wow. And I was working on a few schools, and really Pratt was kind of a love affair. And then I kind of started to synthesize. And I realized that the tools, and I think that's something that, that really, you know, Chabad empowers. I think that's something that the rabbi spoke about. The Balchubas are able, you know, it may not make sense if suddenly, you know, Mr. Geja, um, from Crown Heights suddenly writes a book about Batman. It may be kind of weird, but for me, that's my bag. I have a degree in it. That's, I went to school in this stuff. Mm. I'm immersed in it. Suddenly, I'm the art school student who's back in art school. So to me, to go full circle, and I think Chabad, you know, in fairness and with credit and credibility, you know, have, you know, kind of given me a free pass over there. You know, they kind of let me roll. So, uh, you know, I'm rolling. <laughs> I, I have not rolling. received, considering, you know, I'm writing yeah. about movies and culture and Considering I don't today own a television, uh, you know, wow, I mean, you have a laptop, you have a television, you, okay, you know, and so I do look, at, I do watch form. the Marvel movies. I, you know, I'm not gonna like pretend to be, you know, on a plane because the only place that rabbis did you watch like movies, sweat a bit when you just mentioned that that you watch movies? Are you no, afraid that you're no, never I, I, that? I'm not afraid. I, you know, I, I wouldn't, you know, I don't watch. You know, there's certain, certain things I wouldn't watch. I am kind of, you know, selective on my content, but you know, the movies are so good nowadays, and you know, my kids will watch, you know, like. Uh, uh, kid appropriate things on Netflix, which so on the computer. Um, you know, I, I'm not entirely, you know, segregated and segmented from the world. Uh, but at the same time, I'm able to do it on my terms. And look what's going on now. The media is so niched, and you know, we can pick and choose. It's not like when I was a kid, there was four channels. I'd have to wait till Sunday at seven to watch Beverly Hills 90210. No. R.I.P. Uh, How Luke does Perry, one? Right, uh, right, right. Who was like my hero growing up. And now you can you can pick. It's the Starbucks generation. You can have it how you want it, when you want it. You know, it's like uh, you can watch Stissel. You know, it's crazy. Yeah, uh, Stissel and uh, Sh- Shabab Mikim is coming to town. The guy actually is her, the, the 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 writer and creator of Shabab Mikim, also another very famous uh, Israeli TV show, is coming. I know to town a and huge looking... thing that's about to drop on Amazon. Really? Let's go. We should talk off mic. I can't wow. talk about it right now. Okay. You would be great for this. Oh, what, a role in it? Yes. Oh, it's Rabbi. Talk it's to me. next level it's, stuff. It's in production? It's pre-production? It's pre-production. So it things are being signed. Wow. All right, ladies things and gents, you're hearing it for the first time here. What's going on? Talk. Right. Off camera? Okay. okay. It's, not, it's not my, all right, well, it's not my, it's not my gig. But stay it's, tuned. Uh, all right. Stay tuned. Let's stay tuned. Something big is Don't happening. Don't shave the beard off. That's all I'm saying. No shame in the It could be lucrative. Okay. Yeah, for once, Matt Cage to turn a profit. <laughs> well, if you take control of this uh, deal, right, perhaps. Right. Maybe I'm I'll walk here with a shekel or two. So you are on the edge, you know, Rabbi. You're not. You're not. I'm you're not edge. your typical glory. You're not the tip. You're not the typical rabbi, so to speak, right? Yes. You're here. You're chilling. You're you're dressed in a really swaggy cardigan and some colorful pants and really great uh, slacks and shoes, and you're talking about comics and movies. Do you get slack? Do you get negativity from from the the higher ups or from other people in the community, the Jewish community? Like, what are you doing? You're you're, you're blurring the lines. What? How do you how do you deal with that? And, and do I, you deal with that? Yeah, no, I I mean, in a little bit, abyssal. I think it's because you know I came from my art, so you know I came from that world, and I think in a way I'm like the Chabad success story. You know, I think that like you know um, there's a certain pride in 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 where I've come from and the fact that I've you know, that I do these things through the lens of, you know, I'm not just writing books about Batman. I'm doing writing books about how biblical archetypes have informed and infused Batman. So I'm doing it through a Jewish lens, through a Jewish perspective. Uh, I think, uh, and the fact that that's where I come from. And I think the fact, you know, the Red would talk about people that come from different industries to go back. That's my shlichus. Um, so it makes, for me to go to Comic-Con and be on a panel in Comic-Con and be laying to fill in in Comic-Con and be talking about biblical archetypes, I think it does make sense. You know, I do get the occasional comment here or there, like, you know, rabbi, culture, you know, it's not what we do. Right. But um, things are changing, you know. We live in a world where, you know, everyone, uh, you know, uh, the smartphone is is prevalent. Uh, I mean, uh, and, and the fact that people are, are very tuned in, and I think today are very plugged into the culture. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, 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 you know I, I, I personally, I don't know if that's always a good thing. You know, I think... Uh, 
you know, um, Shabbos, right? You know, I, I th here's what I think. I think sometimes, uh, you know, that weapons of mass distraction could sometimes be worse than weapons of mass destruction. And, uh, you know, I think that uh, it's not always a good thing to just be, you know, uh, right. binge watching everything sure. forever. Um, but I think I have, you know, tried to put a Jewish uh, angle in that space. Um, I do. It gets tough with my kids, though. It gets tough that there are things that I watched as a kid right. that I don't know if I want my kids watching. Where do you watching. draw that line when so it comes that, to So that's your... where I draw the line. You know, it has to be kid appropriate. It has to make sense. You watch Mary Kay? I, 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 we do watch Mary Kay. Uh, all nice. the, not even a joke, by the way. That Mach, <laughs> Macha Bracha has right. saved me a lot of money I'm in, in virtual babysitter. in babysitting. I'm, oh, I just put it on. Totally. I'm gonna, 300 I gotta, million. I gotta tap into, there's something about that. I'm gonna, the Macha Bracha is it's popular the color, kids. It's the color. The color of the vibrancy. By the way, I'm in Wurzburg. The Charedim yeah. love it. We interjected love a lot of color it. in that black and white community. Oh, my God. It's amazing. Yeah, thank really you. Yeah, amazing. it was fun. Shmuel Younger is a great, great artist. Um, it took some time getting, you know, getting them on board. I'm so happy they did. And... They're happy, thank God. The, the community has really yeah, been you did, you broke did. a million and a half views us re, uh, yeah. recently. So wow. that so was. I, cool. I guess I do get the occasional fetch comment. Yeah. But I think people see where it's coming from. I think there's kind of you know a pride in where I've come from and the fact that look at the end of the day, you know, uh, you know, it's it's very nice to uh, go on CNN and talk about Batman. But it's that slice of gefilte fish on a Friday night. It's that Torah class. You know, I'll give you an example. We, I think, I don't know if you were there this year. We throw a wild Hanukkah party. You, you've been oh, there. yeah, I've been there. I've been it there. It gets biblical. Three years ago, I was there. It was gets great. We had a Mrs. Maisel's party this year. Oh, fantastic. And we had every hipster in Brooklyn came. I mean, I'm talking about a thousand people. You've been wow. in my space. It's, it ain't it's big. not that big. Right. Yeah, it's right. not that big. The it's entire nice. block, I don't know big. what the fire department would say <laughs> about that. Um, but we had a big crowd. But you know what? At the end of the day, it wasn't as. You know, there's a word toichen. It's hard to give a, a you know, meaning or it's hard to have substantive Substance, conversations yeah. when there's a thousand hipsters in a, in a Mrs. Maisel's party. Um, the next night we did a, 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 a lighting of the menorah in Pratt. We have over here the broken oh, uh, yeah, behind Lego us. menorah. The yeah, so the Lego we, menorah. we did a, a, a menorah lighting every night. And there was a, you know, we had a crowd, not packed. One night there was one Israeli student that came. One. Wow. She lit the menorah and the way out she said to me, Rabbi, you know, this is the most Jewish I've ever felt in my life. Wow. So it's really, it's about the, you know, I, I tell people it's not about being holier than thou. It's about being holier than yesterday. So you know, mm. it's that one little mitzvah. So I think the fact that, you know, if all I was about was writing books, then that would be, you know, a little, uh, you know, Well, self, Dayenu, Rabbi, Dayenu. You know, that but would it's be, more than uh, that. You know, there's got to be depth. There has to be substance. And that's something that I've always tried to do. Well, talking about, I mean, talking about your books, I mean, you have not just one book, the Ayve about the, the Column of Rabbi, but you have another two books that you wrote. One is called Shtick Shift. Shtick Shift. It's good that people in the Haredi world don't read too many books because this, I've got saved. Uh, this <laughs> what, is Shtick Shift. What is Shtick Shift? shift? I don't know. I haven't read it since I wrote it. But it's, <laughs> it's, it's about Jewish influences on humor. And, you know, it's kind of a study in humor and different, I guess, humorists. and Who where, influenced where? you in, when it came to Jewish humor? Who are some of your favorite? Oh, comedians? my favorite? Yeah. What are, what are they? What I are guess Mel Brooks. Mel Brooks. The movies of Mel Brooks. Mm. As a kid, oh, I love Mel Brooks. Uh, I, today, I'm, a, I'm a, like a Ben Stiller sort of fan. Um, John Stewart, the way he John skewers uh, the media. Um, the way, you know, he kind of... Something that I think you've parlayed in, it's infotainment. It's kind of that mesh of information yeah. information and entertainment in this Bring strange. it all together. I mean, and then I, I wrote this book, my favorite book. The Case for Children. This is children. my favorite, favorite your book. your most recent book. My most recent book that was an unmitigated disaster. Um, well, the, <laughs> super, the superhero book has circumnavigated the globe twice. Sure. I wrote this book um, because people are, you know, the most... Why do you think, why do you think The that? most why endangered you... species on Earth. Is the child. Is not the polar bear or the panda, but it's people. Never before has birth rates fallen so far, so, uh, fallen so far, so fast, and in so many places. I wanted to write a book. People are not having kids. They're pushing it off. You know, it's this kind of extended adulthood. I'm talking to you over there. Um, and, <laughs> and so I wanted to write a book, The Case for Children. Why it makes sense. Yeah. The joys, the pleasures. Well, let me ask you, Rabbi. I'm a young man. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm 29. I'm single. Don't ask. Yeah. Another thing my grandmother reminds me about every right. single day. Right. And 
Push the, it 30. Push, yeah, push it 30. I'm, and I'm excited. I'm, and I'm, I'm really healthy where I'm at, and I'm happy about that. But yes, there is that certain, um, you know, all my friends, my close friends growing up right. are married. They right. have, they're have right. going and working right. on their second or third kid. Um, so the, the culture is, I mean, growing up in my community is to have children. But do you also hear the argument like, Listen, Rabbi, there's a, there's a world out there that's full of pain and destruction. Well, I don't want to bring more children into this world. What do you say to that? I say the future, be, the future belongs to those that show up for it. <laughs> it's very simple. So if you don't show up for it, there ain't going to be no future. Um, so here's what I would argue. Okay, I'm going to give you some truth bombs right now. Okay, We're on camera, but I'm going, it, we're going there. Give, you, me some, give me some good Instagram okay, content so right now. you feel like, yeah. Mayor Kay, yes. that you're going to grow up and have kids. You don't grow up and have kids you have kids and grow up and here's grow up. the dirty secret i don't do homework with my kids because good for my kids i do homework with my kids because good for me i need the structure it helps me it heals me i you know as talented as as the great uh, you know apple uh, creator uh, was over there um, steve jobs steve jobs g- genius guy he doesn't have an app that could compare to the feeling of holding a kid in your arms. There ain't nothing like it in this world. Let me ask you, Rabbi. It's meaning, and it will will make you a better person. Mm -hmm. It will structure you. Let me ask you, though. I mean, you're tying a lot of, like, uh, feelings of, 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 Productivity and feel good around children. There are people who find that within their career, within a nonprofit work and volunteering. Do you think it's necessary that you know to bring in a child uh, uh, into this world? Is that what is needs to fulfill to feel fulfilled? I mean, look, I think career fulfillment is extremely important. I think you have to have both. You don't want to become a martyr to your parents. You don't want to become like otherwise. If you're a martyr, you know you'll resent the kids. The kids will uh, the kids will resent you. But you have to know that I, I do believe that it's easier when you're younger because you're more elastic. You're more crazy. You've got reservoirs. Uh, and by the way, they're cheaper by the dozens. I don't think that, uh, <laughs> you know, like, you know, th- does number four know or care that he's wearing number two's clothes? They don't know. They don't care. You know, um, but what did you they're, want they're sh- happier with the box uh, that the toy came in than the toy itself. Um, but, uh, you know, you know, when you go to a drugstore, I'll give you an example. You know, when you go to the back, what's in the back? There's, 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 there's uh, antibiotics and uh, there's, 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 you know, there's, there's all the vitamins. There's the healing, helpful products. Go to the front, what are they selling? The Inquirer, Hershey bars, and cigarettes. So I do believe that this, this generation, there's a tendency to look for instant gratification. Um, you know, th- that's kind of the binge watch culture. But ultimately, you know, binging used to be a bad term. And I'm binging, that would be terrible. Now it's like, I'm binging, great, mazel tov. <laughs> um, I don't think you'll ever be fulfilled by being binged. Um, so uh, I think that it will it will give you something. It will give you a legacy. I think that all studies show that uh, you'll be happier. Yeah, all, study, uh, all, all the studies show it? Actually, no, they don't. <laughs> yeah, they actually show I'm going to on that one. A, that's actually, a big word to actually, say. There's actually a lot of studies show that you're less happy. Yeah. But, but it does give meaning. I, that, that's my point. There's it does give meaning. There's a difference between happiness and the difference uh, between meaning. So, uh, you know, the, the argument I hear is, yeah, you know, how could you bring another polluter into this world? So I, I would argue that, to the you know, per percentage carbon footprint is far lower uh, amongst families than amongst singles. Because, you know, it's the same, uh, we're using the same carbon footprint if there's six people tooling around in my car uh, there's, uh, as one person. It's the same, uh, you know, past they're in a pot, there's just more of it, you know. So actually percentage-wise, yeah. it's, it, it does, and financially is extremely important. I'll give you an example. The, the, the welfare state is predicated on more people paying in than, than paying out. It used to be 20 paying in for every one paying out. Now it's two paying in. So, um, you know, the world is not, it's not too big, what they say, too big to fail. It's too big to bail. Um, you know, the next generation of the global workforce has not been born already. Europe is a family tree without any branches. It's a one, two, four, um, you know, basically a, a climate where there's one, there's, there's uh, one kid with two parents and four grandparents. It's on. Mm-hmm. You can't have a continent where everyone's living yeah. in a nursing home. But it's fair- not going to work. Which is why China is begging people to have kids. But isn't so the- kids are essential economically, environmentally, uh, and also I think I think for for your own uh, sense of of purpose. Got it. I mean, before you move into children, though, I mean, isn't there more of the question and and the dialogues around relationships? I mean, to be in a relationship, to have, I mean. Normally, I would say um, traditionally to have children, one is in a relationship of sorts. And so is I, what I find in, the, in just being a, a young adult who's single um, is I find a lot of people not really committing to relationships 
on the get-go. Be not even talking about, I guess, say, committing to that relationship and marriage and having children, but that's just relationship at, at, just at hand. I feel like there's a lot more older singles, quote-unquote, that are in today. There's, like, as we know, this crisis that's taking place, the should crisis that's taking right. place. So, like, um, isn't that something to really focus on and to um, – isn't that something that is, yeah, that, that's a conversation to have before even t- talking to children? Or well, would you say, a, this, this or, is the whole of the podcast in itself. I can enough. talk about that. Firstly, two. number one is extended adolescence. I mean, there is a huge problem of the frat house culture has gone mainstream. I mean, like, you know, there are bars in Murray Hill that advertise spring break 52 weeks of the year. So, uh, you know, I think, I think uh, you know, the, the, the boys are not growing up. It's a big problem. You know, as, as women progress men regress uh mm. i think you know there's a huge you know every guys i know that are sitting uh in their boxer shorts smoking bongs playing uh you know uh, what's the new g- the, the video the game the game okay. that uh, the whole world's oh, crazy uh, about Fortnite. that's it everyone's playing it in college as well are you kidding me uh, people are obsessed with it great great so dance moves I it's love this it's this extended adolescence uh that, that goes on um and i think that it is harder to date now I think women are told that they could and they should marry up, and they should marry up. Carly, you should marry up. But however, if you look at the stats, if for, I can't remember the stats, I think it's 67% of a master's degree recipients are women, you can't all marry up. It's statistically not possible. So I think the case has to be made to marry down. And I think that you know uh, babies are born and men are made. Uh, <laughs> so I think uh, you got to make some men over there. And I do think that you will, you know, you think you're going to grow up and get married. Yeah. I don't think so. You get married and you grow up. It forces you to grow up. No one's got it all. You know what I mean? No, you know, we get married young in, these, in, the, in the Orthodox communities. No one's got it made. No one knows what they're doing. But they're figuring it out. They're figuring it out together. And it's through figuring it out. I, I do believe that it does, it, it, it does help and it does inform. But at the same time, you know, I, I, I went to college. You know, uh, I, I'm not. Uh, I'm not saying that someone should just uh, kick a career to the curb. Got it. But you have to know, and this may not be um, politically correct. This this may be the point where I lose. Uh, you know, I lose the uh, the goodwill. Uh, the goodwill uh, of of the you audience. You lost him when you said you but, follow Man, Man City. Right, right but right. biology trumps ideology. Could be a maybe a triggering word over there, but biology trumps ideology. You know, birth rates decline at 27 for women, and, and, and by 40, it's very difficult. So you have to know that. And that may not be PC, but it is reality. So, you know, there is a biological reality to all of this. It's something to think about. I think women are getting married later. They're having kids later. And I think it's, it's afforded them all sorts of opportunities. You look what's happening in England right now. You look at the next generation of royals. They're marrying later. They're having kids when they're older. And they're very accomplished. I'm not... I'm not Attacking that, but what I'm saying is that you know uh, you can't um, push off uh, parenthood forever. Mm. Well, I mean, there's, that's that's a conversation, like you said, for like a full-on podcast. That, that is, I'm, in. I'm doing it. That Peace is fantastic. Children. Yeah, that's really great. So, what um, do you, you and you also mentioned with me having another project, another book that you're working on right now. Yeah. What my, my little pre, uh, preview on that? Little magnum opus. What's what's this talk to me? This is the one. Okay. It, it seems like it seems like that through the three books right now. You started with comic book and you went into you went into uh, the the shtick. You shtick. went into shtick shift. Yeah. And now with the care of children, it's sort of like there's a maturity of. I mean, I, yeah. No, I'm going back. I'm, wait, I'm regressing. You're, <laughs> you're regressing. Yeah, yeah. We're going back going to the frat house. Okay. So book number four uh, is is it's because I'm a narcissist. Yeah. It's a memoir. It's called um, Hipsid. It's a gra- it's a graphic novel memoir. It's it's basically a year in the life of me in Pratt as as art school rabbi. Yeah. But the book plays with time. It goes back to me in art school. So it's two stories. It's me in art school or me rabbi of art school. It goes back and forth. And it's really a graphic uh, novel memoir. It's a kind of a journey of, of my life, my return to I guess uh, traditional uh, Jewish uh, you know observance. And at the same time, it's about me having a a a, a, a um, a bird's eye view, a ground zero view of what's happening in Brooklyn right now. And you must have seen. I mean, the last few years, there's an explosion of coffee, of, of coffee shops, of Jewish creativity and, and, and Jewish pride. And, and yes, this incredible. Can, so it's really, I'm trying to, you're in the book, by the way. Wow. You're what? in it. What? One, one panel. Spoiler alert. Don't get okay. excited. One panel. All right, friends. I, I am very go. blessed Check to have. Check out when it comes uh, out. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a graphic novel, so it's going to take time, uh-huh. uh, but it's written. I've done my part, and we have an amazing uh, artist, uh, Jessica Deutsch, okay. who wrote uh, the Perke Avas graphic novel, an amazing book. I know Jess because her sister went to Pratt. Rachel, big up to Rachel. What's up, Rachel? Uh, 
Jess is is a powerhouse, monumental. I mean, no. I, I think she's one of the most important Jewish artists, uh, you know, of, in this current generation. She's amazing. That's incredible. And and, yeah. and mentioning Pirkei Ovo, it's funny. Yeah, it's really funny. Was she ever on the podcast? Oh uh, no, the book's funny. The book's funny. She's not funny. She, well, okay. She is funny. She's <laughs> she, amazing. You should definitely have her. <laughs> Got that. If if you be lucky to have her, she's amazing. The um, when can we expect the book coming out? You should date her, by the way. But, uh, Oh, topic. really? Yeah. On, the, on the air, we're going to do yeah, that gonna right now. Yeah, wow. on I'm going to debate about... Okay, yeah, yeah, wow. Yeah. Classic, yeah. Rabbi. I know, I know. I know. Um, you just mentioned, I'm going to end off this way, Pirkei Ovot. Pirkei Ovot is one of my favorite um, one of my favorite books that I love reading. So many, so much wisdom there. Do you have a favorite Pirkei Ovot that you like to share? Something um, from uh, that connects with you that you want to share with, with the listeners? Well, talk about uh, blindsided over there, Mayor K. Have a nice day. Have a great day. Yeah, no, I mean, I, there's one line in Perky Alvis. I can't remember exactly verbatim, but it, I, when I read it, I'm like, this is Superman. It's talking about, about being faster, uh, being wiser, and it's like, you know, Superman's uh, be as fast faster as a than, deer. Be a that's the one. I yeah. read that, and I'm like, that's Superman. And I do believe that these, these creators, they, they subconsciously kind of tapped into all this stuff. They grew up with it. You know, they went to Seder's, and this was kind of, you know, their, their frame of writing. Writers write about what they know about. So it's really that idea of being fast, being wise. I was like, wow, man, that's it. Nice. That's and totally to, it. And to end off, uh, you're, you're an outlier. You're someone that's, you know, really created them, you recreated and still creating yourself. So those who are listening, do you have any tips, any, any information you want to share about, about following their passions, following what they love, and also not, not getting lost and losing their identity along the way? What would you say about that? What kind of tips could you tell the young people listening? Yeah, sell yourself without selling your soul. Because, you know, nowadays everything is, is social media. So you, you got to put... And I've noticed in Pratt, by the way, Carly, I don't upset you, but the, the ones that are the most successful are not necessarily the ones that are the most talented. They're all talented. They're in Pratt. You wouldn't be here if you weren't talented. They're very talented. But it's the ones that are shameful and will get push their face into that camera that will kind of get in front of that influencer, that will, you know, get, you know, the article out there. But do it with dignity and do it on your terms. You know, there's a limit. You know, you, you can always tell when someone's... I think today's generation are much smarter than, than uh, us rabbis give them credit for. And they know when they're being preached to. They know when we're phoning it in. They know when we're prophetizing. They know it. They smell it. So you've got to keep it real, which is why I, I dance that, that dance with the superheroes. I don't want to look like I'm like, because they're not Jewish. You know, Jews are not superheroes. Superheroes are not Jewish. And, uh, you know, but they are inspired by Judaism. So, you know, keep it real and sell yourself. It's important, but don't sell your soul. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Rabbi Simcha. You're a legend. You're a scholar. You are a superhero. I appreciate you being on this podcast. Up and up, my friend. Can't wait to see Man, the book. You are. You're a dear friend, a Thank dear you. friend, a dear brother, and our bromance is only getting stronger. Amen. It's just the beginning. Thank you so much for being here, and thank you, everybody who is watching. Have a great day. I'm A-OK. Okay.